Good afternoon. Uh, we're now recording. Uh, this is Mike Regas. I'm the uh, president of the board of directors for ADA and also the chairperson of the medical advisory panel. I'm a pharmacist and I am happy to welcome you um, to be the host of this afternoon's webinar. ADA's mission is to provide and support and advocate for greater than 25 million Americans with immune disorders and we work to promote research and create better awareness for immune disorders. So today we're lucky, this is our fourth educational webinar for the year. We're gonna be joined by two different pharmacists that I have known one for about a year and one for a few months. And so we'll introduce them now. So first we have Alexis L. Curry and she is a pharmacy resident. And she lists that as PGY1 and that makes sense to all of us, but probably not to you. So PGY1 means postgraduate year one and she may do other years after that or may go into practice after this. So she is a resident at special, uh, Trauma Specialty Pharmacy in Akron, Ohio, earned her doctor of pharmacy degree in Northeast Ohio Medical University, and she co-founded a student chapter at that, at that School of Pharmacy where she collaborated with multiple national organizations because of her interest in these diseases, especially Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, lupus, uh, and this and Ada as well. So right now she's also joined with her partner here and his name is Kip Tiger and he's a pharmacist as well. And he, I believe is her supervisor as well. Is that correct? Kip? Okay. Nobody's supervisor, Mike. Okay. All right. So he is a practicing clinical pharmacist at Summa Health Specialty Pharmacy, which is also collaborating with Trellis Pharmacy where he specializes in neurology and neuroscience services. He went, got his doctorate in pharmacy at Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, began pharmacy career Walgreens, and now has an emphasis on medication therapy management and many other things. So we're happy that Kip and Alexis are here with us today. Uh, they're gonna talk about, this is gonna be the first of two different uh, webinars, part one and part two about demystifying autoimmune neurological conditions. And this is a subject near and dear to my heart after retiring from um, specialty infusion pharmacy world where I work with thousands of patients that have autoimmune neuromuscular conditions. So without further ado, uh, echo, I'm going to turn it over to Kip and Alexis. So take it away, please. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate the introduction and it's been great working with you so far. So hi, everyone. My name is Alexis. I'm Kip Tiger. And we'll be presenting today. So we have Lauren here. She wasn't able to make it today, but we do have um, Mike, who is our um, coordinator for this. We have me here, this is me, Alexis, and then Kip. And then we're going to be presenting on the mysteries of the brain demyelinating autoimmune neurological conditions. So for today, we're going to be describing autoimmune demyelinating disorders and the impact on patients and caregivers. We're going to review current guideline recommended therapies and what to expect while on medications. We want to discuss some medications and research that's in the pipeline or currently in production in clinical trial studies. And then we're also going to introduce some resources and support programs for patients and caregivers. So let's first go over autoimmune disorders to kind of get a baseline understanding of what we're talking about. So autoimmune disorders are when the body's own cells miscommunicate with your cells and they detect it as something foreign. So they go in, they find your own healthy cells and they detect it as something that's going to harm you. So they release all of these different chemicals and different signals to cells that go in and attack your healthy cells and destroy them. There are currently 80 known autoimmune conditions the cause is not known, but there are many hypotheses as to why this happens, and we'll get into that. And there are some risk factors that can increase your chances of developing an autoimmune disorder. So I just like this little pictorial here. So this kind of just shows you what the immune system normally does. So it, your cells, when they're acting normal, they identify your own healthy cells with a self marker. And they're like, oh, this is my cell, leave it alone. Let me go find things that are harmful. And then they'll look at other things called antigens, which is something that can potentially be harmful to the immune system or to the body. And then they go find that and then the immune system elicits a response to go attack that antigen. What happens in autoimmune conditions though, is that it recognizes the body's self cells as antigens. 
So looking at some risk factors for autoimmune disorders. So female, we tend to have about a two thirds amount for the autoimmune condition. So about one third of patients are male, two thirds are females overall. Some genetics can play factors into certain conditions. Certain medications can exacerbate them or can cause them. Smoking, exposure to environmental toxins, infections can sometimes confuse the immune system, being overweight or obese, and having a history of autoimmune disease. So let's look at the most common autoimmune disorder. So just to mention a few of them, so type one diabetes, multiple sclerosis, which is one of the conditions we'll be talking about in this webinar. We have rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematous, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, scleroderma, and then we have Hashimoto's disease, which affects the thyroid, celiac disease or gluten sensitivities, and Sjogren's disease. So that's not all of them. Like I mentioned, there are at least 80. Um, do you or someone you know have an autoimmune condition? If you do, you might want to listen a little closer to this. Um, otherwise, like I mentioned, um, there are many of them. It's pretty common when you add them all together. Individually, they're all pretty rare, but I feel like almost every one of us knows somebody or ourselves have an autoimmune condition. So let's go into demyelinating disorders, and that's going to be the main discussion of our webinar. So where do these conditions affect? So they affect the central nervous system, and parts of the central nervous system are our brain, our spinal cord, which is in between our vertebrae and our back, it's like in a canal, and then we have our optic nerves, which go to our eyes, and they send signals to our eyes that allow us to perceive vision. So what happens when these neurons are demyelinated? So what happens in a normal neuron is that you have a signal that's sent from the body, so from the periphery, to say you touch something on the desk. I'm touching the desk right here, my brain is signifying that I'm touching the desk by letting me know that I'm feeling it. So what might happen when it's damaged is say I might touch this desk, but it might not be able to feel that. My sensory can be disturbed because of damage to that myelin or I could try to take a step and I might not be able to feel one of my legs. That could be due to motor dysfunction caused by damage to the myelin. So it can have many different effects, which we will get into, but basically what it does, it's like you have a cord for electricity and it's attached to one of your appliances in your house. It's almost like cutting that cord or causing a disruption in that cord. The electricity can't pass from the wall to the item that you're trying to use. Therefore, it isn't functional or it has less function. So these are some central nervous system demyelinating diseases that we're going to discuss. So there's multiple sclerosis, clinically isolated syndrome, transverse myelitis, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, or NMOSD, and myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibody disease, or MOG-AD. Thanks, Alexis. I just wanted you to say all those words so that I didn't have to. Um, traditionally, when we see these disease states, um, the best way to learn is often through experience. And unfortunately, some patients have multiple aspects of these disease that are not differential um, between the two. In this case, we're gonna look at an actual patient um, that is one of ours from Akron. Um, she is AC, who is a 36-year-old white female um, from Ohio, and she was referred to our neurology clinic for worsening bladder retention um, with no signs of infection. Um, and based off of some of the characteristics that Alexis has presented earlier, you may say she doesn't fit the bill for um, a patient that we may be speaking about. It's important to realize that we have a whole care team, um, pharmacists, prescribers, nurses, um, really anybody that can encapsulate a patient can help provide with their care. So what we see in this case was a patient referral where she messaged into our neurology office with a concern. And her concern is, I just saw my urogynecologist for some bladder issues. She brought up that multiple sclerosis was a very small possibility with the check-in to get that evaluated. She continues to say, I was wondering if you could order an MRI or screen for this. This makes me nervous because of past neuropathy that I've been experiencing. So what we see as AC presents to our clinic um, is a past medical history and past medication. So in 2010, she was involved in a motor vehicle accident, had an onset of migraines with pre-existing condition of depression and vitamin D deficiency. 
fast forward to 2018, and that may see um, as we further elicit the disease itself, um, some dormant periods, you'll see 2018, she started to notice some numbness and hot sensations of her feet that was attributed to pregnancy. Um, fast forward a little bit further into 2022, and we see the start of urinary difficulties. Um, that started the trickling effect of 2023, where she had a dual strep and reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus. Um, the original diagnosis was unknown. She did intimate that it was a reactivation um, from a previous uh, infection, um, which ultimately was consistent with her incomplete bladdering resulting in catheterization three times a day. So prior to seeing us um, in the neurology office, she was previously on Botox, NerveTech, Relpax, and Ketorolac for her migraines predominantly, and then sertraline um, for depression, and it was unknown when, but she may have been taking some vitamin D over the counter, um, but clear history was not, not presented. So as we break down what this looks like from her current issues when she comes to see us, she had been complaining at her visit that she had crawl, uh, chronic dull headache over the past few months with um, tingling numbness of the hands and feet. Um, she had disease manifestations of, of almost electric feelings, um, depending on which country you're from, uh, you may say it differently, um, but uh, that was one of the symptoms that she had seen over the years. There was some difficulty that progressed or started in November of 2022 that worsened through January of 2023. We mentioned previously she had her Epstein-Barr reaction. She did have some numbness of the tongue that did um, subside uh, on its own. And then as per mentioned, she had the hot sensations in the pregnancy along with constipation and then general mild weakness overall. So I'm gonna pass it back to Alexis to dig in. Yeah, so we're going to discuss multiple sclerosis now. So thank you, Kit, for going over the initial presentation of the patient case. So what is MS? It is an autoimmune mediated chronic progressive demyelinating disease of the central nervous system. It is the most common disabling neurological disease, and it is typically seen in young adults. Now, it can happen at any age, but the typical onset is between ages of 20 to 40 years. It usually is seen in young women, and it affects 2.8 million people worldwide, roughly, but 1 million of those are in the U.S. Now, is that because of our geological location, or is it because of other confounding variables? Or is it because of our knowledge and that we look into it, that we have all of these tests, that we enroll patients in all of these studies? Um, we really don't know the reason why we have so much compared to the total worldwide you know, amount of patients, but maybe in the future we'll see changes. So let's take a look at what happens with the immune system and our nerve cells. So first, the B cell recognizes myelin or the protective covering over our nerve cells as something foreign. It detects it as an antigen and it goes and it like triggers, it warns the T cells like, hey, I found something bad, like please do something about this. So the T cell starts releasing all of these chemicals. It starts attracting other immune cells and then they all start causing some inflammation. Then after some time, the B cell creates what's called an autoantibody. So our B cells are responsible for finding something like an antigen and creating what's called an antibody to help fight those antigens. So the B cell starts creating these autoantibodies against the myelin. And then the T cell is like the warrior. It goes in and it goes and it starts attacking those um, myelin covering the nerve cells and the immune cells all start targeting the myelin and causing inflammation and cell damage. So it happens here, as we can see in the meninges of the brain, it also can happen in the spinal cord, optic nerve, brainstem, anywhere in the central nervous system. So some risk factors specifically for MS. So we talked about some for autoimmune conditions, but some that are specific to MS would be being female compared to a male. So three to one ratio for MS. Vitamin D deficiency is suspected as one of the causes of MS geographical location, so farther away from the equator, but not too far. So it's kind of in tempered conditions. So we have the world, we have the equator in the center. As you go away from the equator, it increases the incidence of patients that have it. And as you get farther away towards very cold conditions, it decreases. 
also could have something to do with people where they're living. Most people aren't living in the North and South Pole. <laughs> so some other condition or some other risk factors that can increase your risk would be head injury, Epstein-Barr virus, and um, potentially some genetics, but it's not considered an inheritable condition. So it does have an increased risk if you have a first degree relative or in people that have identical twins, they actually have about a 25% chance of getting MS. Great, so I mentioned Epstein-Barr virus. So Epstein-Barr virus is also known as mono or mononucleosis. It is one of the most common viruses that people are infected with at some point in their life. About 90% of people will be exposed to it. And this virus specifically goes in and it can infect your B lymphocyte cells or your B cells that we mentioned. And B cells have been known to be involved in MS. So what's really interesting is that in January of 2022, the military published an article that found that MS is actually a 32-fold increased risk if you have Epstein-Barr virus or some history of Epstein-Barr virus. Out of 801 cases of patients that developed MS, they only had one patient that tested negative for Epstein-Barr virus prior to their MS onset. And they did mention in their study that that patient could have gotten Epstein-Barr virus from the time of the last sample to their MS onset. So what risk factors does our patient have? So looking at our risk factors here, I highlighted the ones that our patient has. So she's from Ohio, so she fits the ge geographical location. In 2010, she had vitamin D deficiency. She's female. She had reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus with at some point in her previous history, has also had it prior to, and she had that head injury, which led to migraines from her motor vehicle accident. Just wanted to show a map here of the US. So there are different areas of the US that have higher incidence of MS. So we can see in Ohio, it is one of the higher concentrated regions. So these are a list of some symptoms that you can see in MS. I'm not going to go over all of them, but there are some sensory disturbances or changes to the way that you perceive what you're touching or feeling, or you could have, um, you might not even be touching anything, but it could feel like you're touching something, or you can have tingling or numbness or pain. You can have some motor dysfunction. So stiffness or tightness of the muscles, you can have weakness, you can have clumsiness or sometimes what's called um, a gait. So you, when you're moving, sometimes you're just stepping a little off or you could have paralysis of your muscles and lose function of them. There can be some visual changes. So you can notice um, spots in your vision. You can notice reduced ability to see or double vision, blurry vision, or some loss of color. And a lot of times people notice some pain in their eyes. So looking in different directions can cause some different pain. There can be a lot of cognitive changes. So difficulty finding words, difficulty remembering things. Some patients might have depression or changes with their mood. And some have what's called a pseudo bulbar effect where they have difficulty regulating emotions. What that means is sometimes they'll just start laughing or crying out of nowhere and they can't really control it. And then some other symptoms can be some dizziness, loss of bladder control, so that we can kind of think about our patient there, some fatigue and some heat sensitivity. So heat is really important with how our nerves work. When it's hot outside or our body temperature increases, our nerves can't conduct electricity as well as they can when we're at normal temperature. So the symptoms that a patient might have when they're not overheated might get extremely exacerbated or worsened during the time where their heat increases. So looking back, Alexis had mentioned that we have a few of the symptoms that are present with our patients. Um, what we noticed specifically previously, some of the numbness um, that was mentioned that was attributed um, essentially pregnancy, some of the burning sensations, the heat sensations. Um, we've looked at not a whole lot with other motor dysfunction with clumsiness or visual changes, but we did notice depression um, previously with, and then we noticed the bladder control. So as we evaluate what our patient looks like from a laboratory setting, um, we can already see where we're at um, with some of the precursors that we talked about. So Epstein-Barr, um, she was indeed positive for that. Um, previous to the reactivation in February of 23, um, she also tested for a differential diagnosis of her aquaporin um, and MOG FS antibodies. Um, so those were negative. There was some imagery that was done in March of 23. Specifically in this imagery, 
Um, she had multiple, uh, specifically in this case, five hyperintensive lesions of demyelination um, without contrasting enhancement. So Alexis will speak to that in just a moment, but we also fast forward to more laboratory settings. Um, her John Cunningham virus, or JCV, was negative. Um, what's fascinating about this patient was that her white blood cell counts um, in her CSF was extremely elevated. Um, what we look for is a base value within normal limits of less than five. She was at 100. Um, conversely, we look at her oligoclonal banding, which again, Alexis will get to here in a moment. In the normal traditional patient, you may notice some of these oligoclonal bands being zero, potentially one. As seen here, we see her oligoclonal banding um, as 15, which is exponentially high. Yeah, so thank you for explaining that. Um, just one thing I wanted to point out here, her um, the AQP4 and the MOG antibodies, we'll get into this mm -hmm. a little bit later. Um, those can kind of indicate similar conditions, but different ones. So those are helping to rule out other conditions outside of MS for this patient. Um, to kind of touch on the white blood cells, a lot of times when white blood cells are very high in our cerebral spinal fluid, so what the CSF means is basically fluid in your spinal cord, and that's what kind of coats the area where your nerve is in your spinal column. Um, with that being very high, a lot of times it indicates an infection or something else is going on. In her case, she did have that positive Epstein-Barr virus, so this potentially leads us to think that that Epstein-Barr virus is currently active in that spinal column. So going on to this slide here for the diagnosis. So we wanna talk about what a clinical attack is. So in MS, we have what's called attacks or relapses when the immune system is actively attacking those myelin cells. So this is a characteristic symptom of MS and you're going to see here so we have the little, um, if you can see on the MRI there, we have those spots where the arrows are pointing to. Those are areas where lesions are present or there's demyelination. So that T2 hyperintense lesion is what that's referring to. For a diagnosis of MS, you have to have symptoms that last at least 24 hours. You have to see radiographical evidence or MRI evidence of these lesions. There have to be to greater than or equal to two of them, at least three millimeters in size. So whether that's width or length, it has to be at least three millimeters. And they have to show separation of time and space. What that means, so say a patient comes in, they're having symptoms, they get an MRI, they have one lesion. That means that in order to have an MS diagnosis, they would have to have a second instance that causes another lesion. Also, a different situation that we can talk about is say a patient comes in, they have two lesions and one of them is enhanced or contrasted. What that means is one of them is actively demyelinating. So there's a differentiation on these MRIs that we can look at during diagnoses. One of them is like an old lesion that isn't lighting up on the MRI and another one is a new lesion that can be lighting up. So if a patient has that situation that shows a previous instance in the past, she had an attack or he had an attack, and now that is scarred over where there's a new lesion. That can also result in an MS diagnosis. So continuing our diagnosis, we have some different procedures that are called spinal taps or a lumbar puncture. So that is how you collect the cerebral spinal fluid. They go in with a really big needle, they go in through your back, in between your vertebrae, and they suck out some of the fluid that's in that spinal column. Not a very fun procedure, but necessary for diagnoses in a lot of situations. So we take out that fluid and they test it and see all the different components. So we're looking for what's called oligoclonal bands, which is one of the characteristics seen in MS. So we can see here, normally on these IgGs or immunoglobulins, it's uniform. There's not much concentrated lines across. It's kind of light, but that's pretty normal. But then we see on the MS oligoclonal side, we have these very harsh lines across that indicate banding of the immunoglobulins. So that is a buildup of proteins and indication that there is some type of inflammation or auto antibodies going on. So some other tests that can be done, um, antibody tests. So as I mentioned before, ruling out other conditions. 
and then doing what's called electromyography or EMG. And that's when they basically shock different parts of you to see if the nerves are functioning properly. And they stick needles in different areas to check that as well. Also not the most comfortable procedure, but it does give some good information. I can tell you firsthand, it was not fun for me. <laughs> so going on to the next part, Kim. I do think that that is a challenge is when you're presented with patients that are already symptomatic and not feeling well, we're having to do certain tests that we're pushing to get that identified. You know, we're having cerebral spinal fluid taken out of their out of their backs and, and we're having to basically electrocute certain nerve conductions and, and that's challenging and that just compounds I think some of the sensitivities of the disease states like this. So for our patients that are dealing with this, it's very important I think to have the compassion um, as, a, as a provider with that and I think that that's something that is very important. Um, when we look at this in our patients specifically, um, of the tests that were run, um, AC does present with a very textbook example of some of these symptoms. So as previously mentioned, her MRI is consistent with a demyelinating disorder. Now we'll get into the differential diagnosis of that demyelinating disorder, but the 15 oligoclonal, oligoclonal bands is indicative of um, a potential multiple sclerosis diagnosis. Um, that with a revisionist history of, of her symptoms, numbness in the hands, intermittent numbness of the tongue, bladder retention, constipation, um, mild weakness, things of like that, uh, we really can start to put in a true diagnosis of mul uh, multiple sclerosis. So to go back into the other two conditions that I mentioned prior to MS and that list of CNSD myelinating disorders. So clinically isolated syndrome is considered one of the four MS disease courses because it is the first episode of neurological symptoms. Some patients might not go on to developing MS, but depending on the situation, there's between a 20 to 80% chance that that patient will develop MS in the future. So that patient situation that I mentioned before, when somebody presents, they're having an attack, they have one lesion, that's this patient. They have one lesion, they have that instance of an attack on their myelin, but we don't know what caused it, why it happened, will it happen again? So that's one of the presentations that a patient can come to my Additionally, there's something called transverse myelitis or a lesion that is transversing or across the spinal cord. So it has to be um, across both sides of one of the sections of the spinal cord. As we can see here in this picture, it is fully across that spinal column. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> and it is in one location of the spinal cord. So usually this is only one occurrence if it is not caused from MS, NMOSD, or MOG-AD. Now, it can be its own condition caused by maybe a patient had an infection of something and their immune system just got really confused and then it caused this, once the infection resolved, it never happened again. Or it could be indicating that they have an, another condition underlying that caused this. So with MS, you can have lesions in the brain, you can have them in the spinal cord, and sometimes you can also have them in the optic. So going on to the types of MS, there are three recognized types, relapsing remitting, secondary progressive, and primary progressive. Relapsing remitting is the most common. About 85% of patients will be diagnosed with relapsing remitting at some point in their diagnoses. And it consists of periods of relapse and periods of remission. So a patient might have their first attack, they have these onset of symptoms, symptoms then go away. One example that I wanted to point to for our patient for this was she mentioned tongue numbness that went away. So that is a symptom that you're having a demyelination, you're having damage to that nerve, but then after the inflammation goes away, it goes back to normal or baseline. Now, what can happen over time is that after subsequent attacks, sometimes your baseline does not go back down to normal. You have what's called a new baseline. So you have some symptoms that stick with you, but still you're having these attacks, attacks in times of rest or remission. Now with secondary progressive, patients usually will start with relapsing remitting and then they progress into a steady increase of symptoms over time. And then for our most severe is primary progressive where symptoms don't tend to have that relapse and remitting, they tend to just increase over time with progressive disability. So let's look at some treatment options. 
So we have injectable treatment options, we have oral treatments, and then we also have infusion treatments. So looking at our therapies here, this is our injectables. So we have what's called aminomodulators or our interferon betas. And here are some examples of those here. So we have Avanex, Rebif, Plegridi, Betaseron, and Extavia. And then we have our glutiramir acetates, which are two names that are Capaxone and Glotopa. Lastly, our other injectable treatment is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. This is one of our newest therapies called Kesimta. So to kind of discuss a little bit about these, so the dosing for these is different per each drug, and you'll notice that different drug classes have similar trends for how they are dosed. So for our interferon betas, they are either IM or subcutaneous. They can be anywhere between once weekly, three times a week, or every 14 days. With our glutiramir, we have once daily or three times per week, and that is subcutaneous or under the skin. And then Kesimpta is once weekly for three doses and then once monthly. So you have what's called a loading dose in the beginning to kind of kickstart the drug into your body, let it do its job, and then you have your continual dosing after that. So some possible side effects that we see with our interferon beta is the most common is flu-like symptoms. So having fever, chills, body aches, fatigue, those are going to be the most common. Usually patients say that they feel it first day of injection, sometimes the day after. Um, which can be really challenging, especially if you're injecting this three times a week. So if you're injecting three times a week and you don't feel good the day of and the day after, that leaves you one day a week that you're feeling kind of normal. So that can be pretty difficult. Um, not all patients experience those side effects, but sometimes it can be hard for patients to manage. Um, with any injection medication, you can have injection site reactions. And all of our MS medications can increase the risk of infection. One that is different with the interferon betas is it can potentially cause depression. And then moving on to our other ones here, we see with glutiramir, um, something that's different with this is potential chest pain or pressure, some nausea as well. And then key symptom is injection site reactions and then um, headache and infection. So what we're talking about with injection site reactions is pain, irritation, redness, soreness at the site. So looking at our oral treatments, we have four different classes here. So we have our fumaric acid derivatives, our sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor modulators, purine nucleoside analogs, and pyrimidine synthesis inhibitors. So those drugs are Tecfidera, Vumeridae, and Bethyrdum. For the S1P receptor modulators, we have Gelenia, Zaposia, Ponbori, and Mazent. And then we have Mavenclad and Abagio. So to talk about these medications, so for our fumaric acid derivatives, they are dosed twice daily. The S1Ps are once daily, as is Abagio. And then the one that's different here is the Mavenclad. So it's once daily for four to five days. You repeat it in one month. You're done for that year. And then you do the same thing the next year as well. So it's only two years total for the treatment course, and then you move on to a different therapy at that point. Um, and then so talking about possible side effects for these. So again, infection is going to be a risk for most of these. Some of them have higher risk than others, and we'll go into that a little bit further in the discussion. Uh, with our fumaric acid ones, so flushing seems to be common with all of them, GI upset or stomach upset. Um, and then one thing I wanted to mention with these is that Vumeridae has been a more recent drug that's come out and it potentially has less side effects than what we see with the Tecfidera. Looking at our S1Ps, we have headaches, and we have something that can be very severe, and there's actually a um, first dose monitoring with these medications. So bradycardia or first degree AV block. So it's a heart condition that can cause arrhythmias. It's rare, but it did, it did happen enough in clinical trials where they thought it was concerning and they did want to um, you know, make sure patients aren't going to develop any concerns from that. The only one of the four S1Ps is Zaposia that does not have that first dose watch. So that one is a second generation S1P and it is more targeted towards the specific receptors that are responsible for the immune cells to go off and do their thing that's wrecking havoc on the immune system, basically. Mavenclad, um, a lot of side effects with this one. Um, it is less specific. It does affect more parts of the body and it can affect different cells. So your platelets, your red blood cells, your lymphocytes or your immune cells so a lot of other monitoring parameters with that. And then Abagio does have some other changes as well. So 
we have the GI upset, some electrolyte changes, so some more lab monitoring, and then alopecia and headaches. So alopecia is loss of hair or hair thinning, so that can be a concern for patients for that one. Looking at our intravenous treatments or our infusion therapies. So again, with our anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies, only these ones are infusions. Um, they take a little bit of time. You go to an infusion center and this is done in a medical office. We also have our immunomodulator, Tysabri, the anti-CD52 monoclonal antibody or Lemtrada. And we have anthracinetione, which is Novantrone, which is typically a oncology or cancer agent, but it can be used to decrease the effect of the immune system when it's being overactive. So um, one of the, so the two main ones, the two categories are really gonna be focusing on more so would be with Ocrevus and Tysabri. Those are the ones that are more so commonly seen, but the other medications are also used in the treatment of MS. So to talk about these, so all of them are IV, with Ocrevus and Briumv, they are infused day one, day 14, so two weeks later. And then Ocrevus was approved as every six months. And then Briumv is 24 weeks, which is about five and a half months. And then we have our Tysabri, which is every four weeks. It does currently have a limited duration of two years, but depending on clinical judgment can be extended upon that. It is due to safety and um, a risk of PML or caused from this JC virus, which we'll get into. With Lemtrada, it is daily for five days. Then one year later, it's for three days. And then they can either stop therapy or they can continue yearly for three days. And then the last one, the Novantrone, is every three months. The caveat with this one is that it has built up toxicity over time, specifically cardiotoxicity or for the heart. And there is a maximum lifetime dose. So once you reach that maximum lifetime dose, you cannot receive any more of that medication. So with these ones here, they are all a little bit more of the heavy hitters. So infection risk is a lot higher, a lot more side effects to look out for, a lot more monitoring. I did highlight here PML and cardiotoxicity. So we'll talk more about PML. So looking at the current guideline recommendations for selection of DMTs or disease modifying therapies. So they have a level A recommendation, which means that is the highest evidence that they can find to support these recommendations. So the reasons why you would want to select are based off of safety, the route of administration, the lifestyle or the patient's lifestyle, cost of the medication and therapies, efficacy or how well it works, some common adverse effects or side effects, and tolerability of the medication, which those two kind of go hand in hand. So for safety, we're going to look at comorbidities. So what are some conditions that patients have that might limit the medication options that they can be on? Pregnancy, is the medication safe in pregnancy? Is it not safe in pregnancy? Risk of infection. So as we go up in our higher efficacy medications, risk of infection tends to increase. So the harder you hit that immune system, the um, more that there's going to be an effect on your risk of infection because your immune system can't go off and fight other things. Infusion-related reactions. So some patients have some very severe reactions. If they do have a severe reaction to an infusion, it might not be the best option for them. It might not be a safe option. So we might want to find something else. And then risk of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy or PML. So to talk about some comorbidities here, we see that we have heart problems or stroke. You typically want to avoid the S1P receptor modulators. As we mentioned, there is that first dose watch period to make sure that a patient doesn't have these conditions. If they already have a history, they have a much higher risk of developing it from this. Our Novantrone, which has that maximum dose per lifetime, so because of that cardiac risk, and then Lemtrada. Hepatitis B infections. So anti-CD20 therapies and Mavenclad increase the risk of developing hepatitis B infections because they significantly decrease your B cells. And B cells are responsible for keeping certain infections away or fighting them off. For our bariatric surgery patients, humeric acid derivatives are not going to be the best option because there is some of that GI upset. If you're having a bariatric surgery performed and they're decreasing the size of your stomach, you're having already changes down there that you know, is trying to heal, it can be very difficult to take a medication that is going to exacerbate that. Also, it has to be absorbed in the stomach. So you're not going to have those high enough concentration of levels of the drug in your body for it to work well. Malignancy, if you have a history of cancer, 
or in your family, some of the medications to avoid are going to be Mavenclad or Lemtrada. Um, there are other medications that have lower risks, but still have some risks. For example, Ocrevus does have a risk of breast cancer, so that is another one to look out for. Elevated JCV or John Cunningham virus. There are different medications that can increase the risk of this, but Tysabri seems to be the one that has the highest risk. There is what's called a black box warning on that. And then also history of macular edema. So our S1P receptor modulators might not be the best option for a patient that has diabetes because they're already at risk of developing that. Looking at pregnancy, so medications that are recommended in pregnancy are either glutyramine acetate or our beta interferons. We want to avoid specifically S1P receptor modulators and Abagio in pregnancy. There have been a lot of data that has shown that this is very teratogenic or dangerous to new unborn or babies. So um, we want to avoid having any birth defects or any concerns there. Medications that are currently under review, so we have Tecfidera, Ocrevus, and Tysopri. So not sure yet, they're being studied. Um, as of right now, patients can be on Tysobri if they are pregnant and it is considered, you know, that there's benefit, oops, there's benefit greater than the risk. Um, with Ocrevus, it's only in your system about two weeks after your infusion. So you have that five and a half month period afterwards where you just have the effect on the cells. So potentially it might not be dangerous during that time period. But during that two weeks, there has been data that shows it can be potentially harmful to unborn babies. And then Tecfidera is currently in studies to see if it's safe. So what is PML? We've mentioned it a couple of times now. So it is a rapid demyelination of a CNS due to an infection by the JC virus. So the JC virus typically is not harmful. Up to 90% of people come in contact with it at some point in their lives. But when you're on immunosuppression therapy, sometimes this virus can start replicating. It can start overrunning the body because the immune system can't keep it at bay. And that is when this condition is the highest risk and can start happening. So we see here we have this MRI. And this area that I have circled here is very lit up on the MRI. And that indicates an area of inflammation and damage. And that is a very large portion of the brain. This condition can potentially lead to death in some patients because it is so rapid and so progressive. So definitely a concern, definitely something that can really decide what our therapy options are. So looking at route of administration and lifestyle, so does the patient have needle phobia? Is this going to be convenient for them? So some of our medications twice daily, some of them once every six months. Is the patient going to be forgetful on taking that twice daily medication? Would a medication that's injecting less frequent be better for them? Or would they remember better if it's something that's daily instead of being a couple times a week? We have cost. So average annual cost of disease modifying therapies is $94,000 a year. It's very expensive. Most people cannot afford that. So insurance and other options are going to be required. Um, insurance formulary preference. So what does the insurance want to pay for? So although a medication seems to be the best fit for a patient, is the insurance going to think that is the best fit based off of their presentation? So are there other options that we might have to switch them to based off of that? And then copay affordability. So although the insurance might be taking over the brunt of the cost, can they afford the copay with that? Some copays can be up to four or $5,000. So still that is not affordable for most people. Looking at this, so this is a diagram here that goes over how to select medications based off of the efficacy or the severity of the disease state. So we talked about cis or clinically isolated syndrome. Typically, a patient, if they're going to be put on therapy, will be started on interferon beta or glutyramine acetate. Sometimes they're not started on therapy. It's all dependent on their risk. Relapsing remitting is split up into active or highly active. So we have medications that are effective, but maybe not as powerful as some medications, because why put your body through the extra stress if you don't have to? So we also have our highly active, which is our more efficacious medications that are going to really go in as heavy hitters and hit that immune system and try to decrease all that inflammation and overactivity. The only therapy that we have approved right now for progressive MS is going to be our Ocrevus therapy. 
There are other CD20 therapies, but they do not have approval for a progressive because they have not been studied in progressive. Okay, so looking at adverse effects and tolerability. So infection risk, we've mentioned already, if a patient is already at risk of infection. Hey, Mike, can, can, I, can I just um, mention that we're getting close to needing to leave some time for questions and answers. So sure. if you're at a point after, maybe after this slide, we could see if there's any questions. I think Absolutely. I'd be able to. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so let me see here. We do have, so for the slides, we only have about three left and then we do have a question slide. Okay, um, so okay. if we can get okay. through those, then we can get to our question slide. Um, so we have our injectables and infusions. We have our oral medications and then um, other conditions. So medication specific that we've talked about. So there are many reasons as to why we might want to switch a patient off of a therapy based off of any side effects they've had and how well they're tolerating it. So what can you do as a patient or a caregiver to help? So following up with healthcare providers is really important, making sure you're getting that care and getting those assessments, taking medication as prescribed, then having a healthy lifestyle. So modifying your diet, exercising, choosing not to smoke or quitting smoking, getting adequate sleep, so seven to nine hours a night, trying to reduce stress levels, which I'm sure is difficult for most of us, but trying to do your best there as you can, and avoiding overexertion or overheating. Lastly, some vaccination considerations. So all live vaccines must be given at least four weeks prior to starting immunosuppressive therapy, and you should not give live vaccines during therapy. So like what happens with the JC virus, when the immune system is low, certain viruses can multiply and wreak havoc on the body. We don't want that to happen with a vaccine. The point of a vaccine is to prevent illness, not cause it. And then some vaccines may be given during treatment. So they're called inactivated vaccines. Asking your provider or your pharmacist which vaccines are best for you would be the best approach for that. And then here I have a list of an example of some of the live vaccines. So how do you consolidate all of that into a therapy? Um, I think it's very challenging and it's certainly not an easy process. It has to be patient specific. And Alexis, just uh, so many options and so many reasons. In this specific case for AC, what was decided upon um, by approval of prior authorization through the insurance, through grants and fundings, through copay assistance, um, as well as meeting lifestyle um, tendencies, um, injection, tolerability, and frequency, we landed on Kisimta. Um, Kisimta, I believe in this patient, meets the best criteria for disease-modifying therapies, um, self-administration, and medical awareness, um, followed up with uh, just her family uh, options. So she has a lot of support um, from, her family, from her family lifestyles that lended us to this. And it really does seem to be a perfect fit in this case. We're still early on in the therapy process, so hopefully have uh, a lot of great outcomes from there. So I think, uh, as Alexis had intimated, we are up for some questions. I, I'd like to thank you guys for a great presentation here. I was reminded of the fact, while you're doing this, that I was working in the home infusion industry in 1993, so that was 30 years ago now, and that's when the drug beta seron first came out. And I had two twin sisters as patients that were both prescribed beta serin. One was able to get it via the lottery and the other one wasn't. And so they had a, a great psychological dilemma who was gonna get it and would they be happy with each other after that. So it turned out the one that got it uh, got better, but eventually she ended up with a skin reaction to getting the beta serin injected. She got a lipodystrophy and had to stop anyway. So early on in my career, when the very first drugs came out, before that we were giving steroids to everybody. And so now we have more drugs we can shake a stick at, which is good. We're trying to figure out exactly where they fit is, is right. obviously a new problem. So I am appreciative of you guys at the level of detail. And I would like to ask you to send me a copy of the slide so I can have it for my records. I'd appreciate that. Currently, I don't see any questions coming from the audience. And what I'd like to do is maybe ask a couple of questions. So uh, being as the fact that I've been involved in this autoimmune neuromuscular diseases for the last 20 years in my practice before I retired, and I see um, what's happened to these multiple sclerosis patients. So do you feel right now, 
say if we take 1993 to 2003 to 2013 to 2023, I mean, can we get a good idea that this patient's lives are actually improving with all these options? Or and are they living longer and having better quality of life? Um, I just think it's hard to figure out if you have so many options now, what's the end result for the average patient? So um, what do you guys think about that? Do you have opinions first? I certainly have a lot. Sure. Um, so now that therapies are much higher, Highly or higher targeted. They are going to the specific areas that we have found through trial and error through many studies to find, okay, this is where we're thinking the immune system is involved and where it's most involved. It's allowing us to have much less side effects than we would see with just, like, for example, taking steroids or taking something as a treatment rather than a prevention. So we're going in, we're preventing these disease activities from happening instead of trying to treat it after it's already happened. So back to prior to 1993, you only had steroids to give. You were having symptoms, having active demyelination. You go in with steroids to treat it. That doesn't prevent the damage that just happened. It's already happened. All you're doing is stopping it. So with these medications now, we can have relapses with a period of remission for two years or greater. So rather than having attack after attack and going in and treating it each time it happens, we can have longer durations of remission and only go in with our steroids when it's absolutely necessary, when there's, um, can, when you have a relapse while you're on therapy or a breakthrough from your therapy. But some patients have been known to not have relapses while on these preventative therapies and can go up to six to seven, eight, nine years without having a relapse. So it's very patient specific. And I do think that with new data coming out and new medications, we're getting closer and closer to having better qualities of life and less disability in our MS patients. And I think it speaks to our profession as well as pharmacists that we're gonna have more specific therapies. Um, and traditionally that means safer therapies, but in the case with autoimmune disorders, you're, you're ratcheting up the, the escalation. Uh, you know, when you're talking about beta seron and, and, and lipodystrophy, you know, that's one component that might not have a tolerability. You, you juxtapose that to Thesabri or, or Ocrevus that has PML, which is fatal. Um, and I think that it's the need for continuous care, um, chronic support, not just by professional health um, providers, but also by family, by support groups. I think, I think that's why this is so important to have education out there. Um, anecdotally, what we would see is, is our providers that were, that were uh, in practice for multiple sclerosis prior to, you know, some of our even original therapies of, of uh, Avonex and, and our beta interferons, we were using ice packs. You know, Alexis had it illustrated that heat was a major player. They would, they would bring you into facilities and hospitalize you and give you jackets that could support with ice packs and hats that would support with ice packs. Um, and to think that where we come now with the um, absolute precision and definition of immune specific responses is unbelievable. Um, and what we have to look forward to with the MS Society investing so much in, in future care and, and basically to eradicate this disease um, is, is breathtaking. I think that it's very exciting to see where we're going to go. And I think, I think, Michael, we have a few slides that just illustrate that. Um, I don't know if we just want to fast forward um, or if you have further questions there. I think that we just have a couple of cool things for, for resources that we wanted to, to put out as well. Yeah, let's go ahead. There's still no question showing other than my question, so let's go ahead and okay. show that see resources are very important for this group. Yeah, uh, and one thing I did want to mention, we do still have two other disease states to discuss, but we can continue on to that with part two. Yeah. But we'll just go over with the um, resources for now. But we'll continue to discuss some of that in the next discussion as well. And as Alexis kind of pushes forward, one of the things that we spoke to with disease treatments is now we're not just considering multiple sclerosis as a huge umbrella. We're able to refine what diagnosis is for each. And part of those um, antibodies that, that we were testing for early helps us to differentiate between what is MS versus what is, um, you know, as it's previously called MS of the eyes or, or um, juvenile MS in some instances that it is just an antibody response. So, so those are the things that we get in with specificity. And it is, it's, 
I always make the comparison. It's like driving a Model T Ford car um, to a Tesla. Yes, they're both automobiles, but frankly, they're they're not even the same category. So so that is so important as we look the past, the present, and then certainly the future. Okay, well, I like that answer, and I'm, I'm looking for the slides that you got here. So let's discuss yeah. them. All right. So what we have here is financial assistance. So many of the, way, uh, the ways that we have barriers as pharmacists, we look to have comfortability um, and re re resolution of barriers. Unfortunately, because of the cost, as we had said earlier, financial assistance is, is just paramount. Um, some of our manufacturers are massively supportive in free drug programs. Um, frankly, a lot of our patients wouldn't have access without this. And this includes patients without insurance at all, um, all the way to patients that do have insurance and their insurance may have a high deductible plan or um, maybe just even a 10 to 20% copay um, leaves us with a $20,000 bill in some instances. So we have copay assistance programs. And then specifically here, what we utilize in our current role is nonprofit funding. Um, and, and this is through, uh, you know, things, grants, I think back to ALS, and we'll speak to this in our next seminar, but Ice Bucket Challenge, just um, community funding and awareness and advocacy. So what we have listed um, in the presentation for all those that may need help advocating for themselves um, is a list of HealthWell, um, PAN or Patient Access Network, the Assistance Fund, Good Days Fund, um, and then a lot of copay relief programs with the numbers. Um, we also have, and, and I would be remiss to say that so much of our information comes from the hard work um, of a, our MS society. Um, we have MS navigators that is a part of that, that are available um, nonstop in, in the passion and the awareness that we have um, with Multiple Sclerosis Month and Awareness Month. Um, we have MS toolkits that we have that is so wonderful for support and emotional health and well-being. You know, sometimes we put our patients um, in a clinical clinical box, and we have to realize that it's more than that. They're moms, they're aunts, they're dads. You know, they're they're real people. And what you need to do is to evaluate that and focus on the emotional well-being. You know, how do you feel physically? Um, how motivated are you for your care? How much do you want to eat? Um, how much can you eat? Where are you at as far as an exercising? Maybe you were an avid runner, and and with some of the neuromuscular dysfunctions that come with that, you're not able to really participate in that as much. So there's so much that we get, not into just the spiritual um, and, and support standpoint, but the physical, the nutritional and everything with that as well. So this is just a slide that I think illustrates that um, with, the, with the support um, and things of that nature. So I don't know if we want to wrap up to a conclusion or if there's any other questions that we have. Well, I think there's no other questions showing right now. And I know we have part two coming I don't think we have a, do we have a date schedule for part two already? Not yet, but that will be announced very soon. Lauren and I will be discussing that after this webinar. Um, and we'll have the part two to continue discussing the rest of this presentation. So to go over our NMLSD and our MOG antibody disorder. And then we will also be discussing myasthenia gravis and ALS. Michael, I think she wanted to make sure I behaved on this lecture before she invited me back. Okay, good. And those, and those other diseases, we're going to talk about some of my favorite diseases, so I'll be happy yeah. to be with you on that one, too. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Drs. al Corey and Dr. Tiger, for being with us this afternoon and taking your time to help educate us. Um, I'd like to, for the attendees, I'd like to take a few minutes, ask them to take a few minutes to take the quick survey at the conclusion of the webinar to better serve. And also, if you enjoyed the presentation, consider making a tax-deductible donation to ADA on our website www.gotoada.org and we will announce the a date for the second part of this as soon as we have it and I would like again like to thank you and our attendees for joining today I'll stop the recording and bid you all a good day thank you thank everybody you so much thank you okay bye